Hi there. Uh, my name is Brian O'Fallon. I'm an Agile coach here at Agile Velocity, and I've been in the software world for about 20 years. I've been doing something Agile uh, for about 10 years. I was in a small company that was acquired, and I was a project manager who was told to become a scrum master. Did that, and I fell in love with it. And in the last 10 years, I've been in all different kinds of Agile roles, scrum master, product owner, manager, both of those functions, and more recently, an external coach who goes in and helps clients implement different Agile methodologies. Reese? Hi, and I'm Reese Schmidt, also an Agile coach here at Agile Velocity. I have been in software not quite as long, uh, somewhere around 15 years. Most of that has been in some form of Agile, Agile, Scrum or Fall. We do sprints, so we're Agile. Uh, in that time, I've worn many, many hats as well. Everything from QA to tech writer, UX designer to finally landed on Scrum Master about seven years ago. Uh, since then, have been coaching teams. I counted this morning. I'm up to somewhere around 50 teams, wow. give or take. So in that time, I've seen many, many a backlog refinement. A lot good, a lot not so good. So hopefully we can share some of the wisdom that we've gained over the past few years to help you guys get your backlog refinements back on track. So without further ado, Brian O'Fallon, please take us away. Okay. Oop. So... Oh, hey, oh. you guys get to see our faces yeah, there, again. Yeah, there's our faces. Sorry. Again. Okay. So before we jump into some of the tips and tricks and common patterns we see out there in the field, I'd just like to give a little context. What, what backlog refinement is really all about? And at its core, backlog refinement is a conversation between the product owner who has a vision for the product and some specific requests of what they want the team to do, and the team who's going to actually be implementing it. So we ask the product owner to come into backlog refinement with a clear vision of where they're trying to take the product and some specific what style requests. And when we have that conversation about the value and about the um, request of the team, and the team can uh, interact with the product owner and come to that common understanding, the team will also get a sense of how big it is and can give the product owner that information, how large things are, so that the product owner can make a, a, an informed decision about what should be prioritized. And I think that's pretty standard issue stuff, but it's just good to um, set the stage because I think from now on, we're gonna talk about all the things that go wrong. Yeah, yeah. so that, that was right. So one of the first things that we see a lot is that backlog refinements treated as kind of a spectator sport. Everybody comes in and sits down and it's the product owner's show from there on out. And so one of the things that we can do as a team to get really prepared for backlog grooming is be prepared. Honestly, mm -hmm. go through the backlog, go through those top few items and dig in, whether that's thinking of questions or digging into the code or just going and talking to the rest of your team about the top items, that's going to set you up for a really, really collaborative backlog refinement. And product owners, you can set your team up for that success by either sending out an email and saying, hey, here are the top things that are going to be in contention for backlog refinement. Or maybe if you're using something like Jira, you can set up some designation in there. Um, but anyway, making sure that your team has the opportunity to look forward is going to make it yeah. successful for everyone. And I think it goes without saying that the product owner has to be prepared, but the, the, the team having a little context before they go in really can help that yeah. collaborative interaction. Absolutely. If you walk into, say, like a book club, which I might have just dated myself, and only one person's read the book, that's not really going to be a great conversation. So right. really come in prepared. Well, the other thing, or maybe the next thing that we, we highlighted is um, things we've seen out in the field that uh, that kill that conversation is having one person uh, driving the conversation. And that can be everything from a, a very product owner presentation centric way of doing things. But another one that we see a lot is uh, one person who's driving the tool. So if you're using Jira and you have one person with a keyboard in front of them, entering in all of the notes and um, scrolling through the screens, it's almost impossible for 
the, the conversation to remain collaborative. Everyone just ends up staring at that one person as they struggle to find the right button or type up the last note. It's, uh, and they get nervous and they get worse at it. Um, but we really don't want to have just one person driving. We really need it to be a collaborative discussion. Yeah, one way you can do that is to have everybody have a pad of post-it notes and a Sharpie. So when you guys are talking up acceptance criteria, when people are asking questions, anyone can write it down. Like, oh, hey, you got that one? Okay, cool, yeah, next one. Oh, I'm writing on that one. So kind of see behind us a bunch of post-it notes around user stories. So one of the best ways that I've found to up-level your backlog refinement is just to turn the TV off. If everyone is co-located, you can just turn it off. But it's yeah. a 60 inch TV, it's gorgeous. It's amazing, I, but you know what happens when you sit in front of a 60 inch TV in one of those comfy conference room chairs, you just lean back and sink it. That's not gonna create collaboration if everybody's up and engaged and actually on their feet. So if you look behind us, I kind of created a little, um, I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna say murder board, but FBI kind of board strategic planning thing like this that's that's something that you can do you just write out the user stories bring them in and then the product owner is getting everyone on their feet they're looking at collaborative looking at it collaboratively you can even put up you know white sheets of paper around so that people can just scribble out little mocks and things like that it creates a really awesome environment for the whole team to be engaged rather than just everybody leaning back and reading the tickets yeah, on the we, we've done that a fair bit just for if we do use a tool, and almost everybody does nowadays, um, which is great, but print out those Jira stories, mm -hmm. slap them up on the wall, and then have everybody go around with a, a pad of Post-its and um, put up those acceptance criteria as you come to that common shared understanding. Yeah, absolutely. So next up. You know, so we just talked a little bit about the, the process uh, that we, we might use to get everybody engaged. But then there's the work itself, the, the backlog items that we're talking about. And as we're going through those backlog items, there's a couple things we've noticed that are uh, um, going to be problematic. And, and one of the first ones is if the stories aren't vertically sliced, um, that's just going to uh, um, make it very difficult to have that value-based, why are we doing this discussion? If it's uh, giving a new capability to the users that is going to let them do something exciting and cool, it's really easy to get behind the value we're delivering. If it's insert database table uh, here. Um, add that, two columns. Add two columns, uh, insert trigger. It's uh, impossible to get excited about it and also to really bring your whole mind and creativity to solving a problem because you've really been presented with a component task. Yeah. The other thing that I see a lot is backlog items are just too freaking small. Like I don't I don't know who came up with the the mission statement for every scrum team that I've worked with that said, you know, your goal is to break down the backlog items as small as they possibly can get. Stop. Roll them back up want big meaty valuable things when you see in those scrum books like do you laugh when you say oh four to six items in the backlog for the sprint no that's real that's a goal that's those are big meaty things that the whole team can work together and collaborate on mm -hmm. and when you're in backlog refinement you're having a meaty rich discussion digging deep into why this thing is going on and what you can accomplish rather than oh well that button goes to that well we don't really need to have much of a conversation yeah. about that right it's hard to remain vertically sliced when we get so small and i know that you'll get a lot of advice to uh, slice them as small as possible and that may be an end state but it's hard at first to conceptualize something that small and still keep it vertically sliced we'd rather see you keep it vertically sliced and a little bit bigger so we have a poll. We want to see you guys in your last backlog refinement. How many items did you get through? So you should have a poll coming up. We will wait until we get some of those responses in. All right. So what are our percentages? So it looks like 
Uh, most of you are at three to five items. Yeah, most of you, about 50% of you guys are around three to five items. Okay. So that kind of leads us into our next question, which is uh, the discussion. If you're getting through fewer items than you want to, there's a few patterns that Reese and I have seen out there. And the first one, I think, is just about um, the team wanting to dive way too far into what's being requested. And, and I know that that sounds a little, um, a little at odds with what we were just saying a, a minute ago, like, hey, we're trying to have this rich conversation with the product owners laying out the value and getting the team excited about the goal. But I've really seen that sometimes um, the teams get so caught up in asking very, very detailed questions that really aren't the point. We're, we're trying to understand the, the value and the goal, and they really rat hole on really minor points that need to be figured out as we uh, get into the sprint. Um, and the consequence of that is discussion goes on too long and you lose people. The engagement slips away and we end up uh, with fewer things being uh, pointed at the end of it. Really, we want to have that discussion lo as long as it takes to make sure that we're all on the same page about the, the value of it, the, what we're trying to do, what the intent of the story, it's usually a story, what the intent of the story is. And, uh, and once we're there, let's cut it off. Yeah, when I see people are like, oh, we need this question answered, this question answered, this question answered, it's like, is that going to change the size? Mm -hmm. Is the answer, getting the answer to that question, yeah, maybe we want to have it before we start working because it's pretty critical, but is it going to change the size of the thing? No? All right, let's move on. Mm -hmm. Because the, we'll have other opportunities to talk about, you know, what, what the intent of the, or, you know, what the details are. But as long as we get to the intent of it and we can understand how to size it, we're giving just enough information back to our product owner so they can make a great value-based uh, decision about priority. Absolutely. And we also see people digging into the how. If you are tasking out your stories and backlog refinement, you are digging way too deep in the how. Save that for sprint planning when you're really about to dig in and start doing the work. Save that figuring out how you're going to solve it for then. I just had a conversation with a team this past week and we were talking about how do we pull ourselves back up? And I use the analogy of cooking. Mm -hmm. Have you ever cooked dinner for yourself? Yeah, well, when it's just me, I, I usually just have cereal or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, or have you cooked dinner for your family? Oh, sure, lots of times. Is that bigger or smaller than cooking dinner oh, for yourself? way bigger. How about have you cooked for a dinner party? Say oh, seven yeah. to 10 people. Oh yeah. Yeah, how about a big backyard barbecue? Yes. All right. Bigger or smaller than the dinner party? Much bigger. Did we talk about recipes? No. Did we no talk need. about what food you're going to bring? Right. We didn't have to go to the store. We didn't have to do any of those things, but you know whether it's bigger or smaller. And we're not experts in cooking. No. We are asking not. people who are experts in building software to size things bigger or smaller than your friends. That's it. Yeah. Bigger or smaller than your friends. So really digging into that how is not necessary to understand mm -hmm. whether it's bigger or smaller than the story that we just talked about. And what we're really going for, uh, of course, is to give just, do just enough planning to give the product owner the information they need to prioritize. Yeah. And there will be uh, more opportunities as a technical team to dig into the tasks required to do that job. But we don't have to do it right off the bat. All right, so we're gonna jump into a few questions. So. We get a ton of questions from our CSM and CSPO alumni, and we wanted to grab a few of those questions to start off with to give you guys a few minutes to start putting your questions in. We only have a couple right now from you guys, so we'll give you a few minutes while we answer some questions from our classmates. Okay. All right, mm -hmm. so the first one that we got, and we got a couple of these different flavors, um, all other meetings are very defined in Agile slash Scrum, day, time, length. Why is there so little structure around product backlog grooming or refinement as it's mm -hmm. referred to now? Well, the answer is because it's not an official Scrum ceremony. 
Yeah, it's a little bit shocking because it will show up in every class you will ever attend on the uh, you know, Agile or in Scrum, uh, but it's really not an official Scrum event. The um, you know, Scrum is great at picking up things in the prioritize backlog and all about how we execute on them and refine our uh, product and our process, but really it's pretty silent about how those things get into the product backlog. Yeah, it says that you need to spend up to 10% of your time preparing for the sprint ahead, but it doesn't say how. Mm -hmm. um, so something that we've said is kind of a best practice at this point, it's not official, but it's a best practice, is doing a separate backlog refinement from sprint planning. So we know we're not very good at just coming in and being revealed a, a backlog, mm -hmm. just being told what it is for the very first time and then having to commit and figure out how to do it. Right on the spot. So separating that by a few days from the sprint is gonna give you a much better success on, sorry, we're clicking things yeah, yeah. and trying to get to the next question, much better success um, for the team being prepared. Yeah, and so that, that, that goes right into the when does it happen. Um, it should be during the sprint and we really recommend that it happen what, a couple days, or more in front of sprint planning, just to give folks time to think it over, maybe do some exploration in the code base, maybe give the product owner a chance to go get some clarifying questions hashed out so that you're really ready to go by the time you hit sprint planning. Yeah, some teams will do it on the off week of, if they're doing two week sprints, they'll do it on the off week of their sprint planning. So every Wednesday at 9 a.m. we know that we have a thing that we need to come into and we're getting prepared for. Some teams find that might be a little too far away from sprint planning. If you're having to do the first half of sprint planning as backlog refinement for all the new things that came up right. in the last five business days, maybe scooch it in a little bit closer so that you're not doing things twice and creating waste. Yeah, we want to avoid um, making every Every event is backlog grooming event as well. Absolutely. Refinement. Who's responsible for grooming? That's a fun one, I think. Um, you know, the, the way I always think about it is the product owner is responsible for making sure there is a groomed backlog. But refinement, and we keep using those interchangeably, sorry. Uh, refinement is a participatory event that the whole team, product owner, scrum master, and everyone who's required to be on the team to do the work uh, has to do together collaboratively. So it's the product owner's responsibility to make sure that it happens, but it's the whole team's responsibility to join in and collaborate on it. All right. All right. So I think we answered all of the previous questions. We're going to close out of the presentation so that you guys can see our faces a little bit bigger and we will move on to your questions. Brian you want to take the first one? Okay what is the difference between backlog refinement and backlog grooming? A new name for the same thing. It had cultural uh, implications in some countries that were not positive so we uh, have, as an industry, migrated to just calling it backlog refinement. So, that's anything, a great answer. Anything to add? No, okay. absolutely not. We got a couple of questions around, as soon as I said co-located team, we got a few questions that popped up around remote, uh -huh. uh, remote workers and things like that. Anything that you can do to create more of a collaborative environment for your remote folks is going to create a lot more success. Um, if you could use some sort of Local online, scribe or, oh, okay. uh, online collaboration sure. software, if you if your company is has Google Docs or things like that, um, Board Thing is another one that I've used that allows people to just throw Post-it notes up. Anything that you can do to kind of have everyone be able to input information and if one person's remote, sometimes it's better for the collaborative environment if everyone acts remote. So maybe everyone has a keyboard at that point to be able to input things so that the whole room's not looking away and at a whiteboard while the speaker is behind all of their backs and they're trying to collaborate with the one poor person on the phone. So wanna make sure that anything that you're doing 
make cameras, face-to-face -face communication is very important, and any online collaboration software that you can use to do this. I did this with a team the other day, and then three people were on the phone, and we were able to use a whiteboard, but we got a really good camera and mm. made sure that everybody could see it. We wrote really big on the sticky notes when we were, um, when we were reading something off, we would make sure to like hold the sticky note up to the camera so that they could see and everybody was really able to engage a lot more. And another thing I've done, mm -hmm. and I think you've done something similar, is we'll uh, um, sometimes have the scrum master who probably isn't as active in this meeting, uh, act as the, uh, the, the scribe and make posties on the behalf of the remote team member. That only works though if there's one or two remote team members. If we're all distributed, then use it use an online tool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Use your use your chat. That's your friend. Mm -hmm. Something that you already use to collaborate as a team. Use that tool. Don't try to maybe use new tools. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Thank you, thank you, one of our, our chat folks for saying book clubs still are a thing. Yes, here in Austin, if you okay. were part of Agile Austin, we do have an Agile Austin book club. So mm -hmm. yes, book clubs are still a thing. I'm trying to jump through some of the chats. Let's see what's next on well, the list. Uh, let, let's address this one here uh, very much. There, there seems to be a theme here about uh, remote folks. When uh, this one, that I want to address next is specifically about a remote product owner. And that's tricky. To be honest, um, that, that is a hard situation. I'd, I'd much rather deal with a, a, a team member, one team member being remote than the product owner being remote. I know that that sometimes happens. Um, and please get yourself a good video conference <laughs> uh, set up um, and make sure that uh, you, you're paying attention to the product owner, but I, I've seen it work. It's, it's a little harder. It's difficult, but um, it, it can be done. But I, I, don't, I don't have great advice on that one because I think other than putting them on the video cam conference and having them describe the value and what their in, intent is, is the only thing I've seen work. One thing that I've seen work really, really well is when the Scrum Master and the product owner have a really, really good collaborative uh, working relationship where they're able, the Scrum Master is able to kind of do handoffs with that, with that product owner. And I don't mean handoffs as in like the information uh, or being kind of a telephone game or anything, the product owner not being there. I mean, with the product owner there, the Scrum Master is able to kind of take the things um, that the product owner is talking about, get those up on the board, working with team that way, as, as well as making sure that if that product owner is remote, they're all working in the same time zone. I think that's another okay. thing that's very, very important so that they are able to be in those meetings. I had a product owner one time that was in London and um, we just made sure we did everything in those early morning mm. hours for Austin time for Make, making sure that the product owner was able to really be with the team and collaborate, be part of backlog refinement. So it wasn't a game of telephone through our um, tracking tool. Okay. Um, by the way, I just have to do a, a, a shout out on the uh, book club comment. Thank you, Katie, for making that. I worked with Katie uh, this last summer. So thank you, Katie. Um, we also got another comment in the chat um, from Tony who says he's been uh, a remote PO for years and using Skype for business has uh, worked for him. So that, that's fantastic. It's a, it's a bit of a challenge, but I think that it's part of the reality of many of our clients is that there are some number of remote teams. So fantastic uh, team so, members, I should say. So here's another question that we've got in the chat. Why not do a little bit of refinement every day? That can absolutely work. Yeah. I had teams who spent the, the 15 to 30 minutes after stand-up every single day refining the new things that were coming into their backlog. They were doing Kanban, uh, yeah. so it worked really well for them to have a continuous refinement process. But if the, that's something the teams want to do, just refining every day, do what works for you guys. Again, like mm -hmm. we said, with timing on refinement, whether it works better for the team to be on the off week or whether it works for the team to be a couple days before, 
doing it daily might work and continuously as well. Do yeah. something, try it, retro on it, and make sure that you're updating it to fit your your team's way of working. Yeah, d d doing a little bit of refinement every day is great. Just keep focused. Um, sometimes when you have a meeting every day, um, it can tend just to become a uh, discussion uh, section without uh, as much focus as you'd like. Um, I, I'd like to jump on, ooh, just got small. I'd like to jump on one that got um, posted in the Q&A window. Um, what are the other opportunities for the team to dig into the technical how of a task ahead of planning? Ooh, that's meaty. That, that's a fun one. Um, so when we say that backlog refinement is really specific around creating a shared understanding of the value and the intent of the story and that it's really not a place to go into um, the technical how, that doesn't mean that the team can't go off and do some investigation. I would caution you though, um, and I'm a little concerned, anonymous attendee, that the uh, uh, digging into the technical how, how of a task ahead of planning uh, makes me concerned that perhaps your your stories aren't vertically sized. And if you need to resolve a technical approach in order to properly size something, that's legitimate. It shouldn't happen too terribly often, but sometimes you get a situation where if you're gonna be honest, you'll have to tell the product owner, I don't know how big it is, because I don't know if we know how to do this. Uh, so there's, there's ways of resolving that, um, like spikes um, it, that you might do to look at a technology. Uh, but just be careful. It sounds like pot potentially you're asking, should we task out ahead of time, ahead of planning? And please don't, because you never know if that story that you think you're being helpful on and tasking out is actually going to be prioritized at the top of the backlog. Once you get into a groove, you'll oftentimes find that that backlog gets uh, tweaked and revised and reprioritized right up until the very end of the sprint. So resist the temptation, do the planning, I'm sorry, the tasking, which is the plan for the sprint in the sprint planning. Absolutely. And we want to also talk a little bit on that as well about making sure that you are leaving some room at the end of the sprint. Um, don't always rely on putting a, ta a, a spike in the next sprint and then you have to wait to do the work till the following. Make sure you're leaving a little bit of time between the between backlog refinement and the new sprint so that you do have that time so that you're not always booked up right into the very, very end of the sprint. All okay. right. So we got another question in the chat. As a scrum master with a new or absent product owner, what is the first baby step I can take with coaching my new product owner on how to start refining without getting vacant stares? <laughs> <laughs> I feel for you. The vacant stares are uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty demoralizing. As you say, this is your big thing. This is why you're the product owner, to help <laughs> us get to a refined, prioritized backlog. And if you're getting vacant stares, that it's pretty painful. Absolutely. Uh, I, I've done this wrong before. Okay. <laughs> so just going, you're the product owner, you own the vision, go do. I'm not starting this sprint planning until you have a backlog is not the right way to do it. Um, I know bad baby scrum master did that one time and I regret it now. You've got an opportunity to really, really help this person to become a really great product owner for that team. There are tons of books that they can read. Uh, I just handed off 50 great tips to build a better backlog or something like that. Um, there's agile users. Oh man. Now you guys, I'm like, my book brain just went away. Mike Cohn's written a book on user stories. Yeah. Roman Pilcher's written tons of books. Roman Pilcher has an amazing blog that you can 
go and, and, and dig into and help them find resources, you could send them to a certified product owner class. Uh, those, that's going to give them a great foundation. But absent of all of those things, just helping them to really identify the who, the what, and the why on all of those things that they, that, that are needed to get this feature or this product out the door, those are going to be super helpful. Helping coach them to build a backlog, helping them vertically slice stories and not be focused on technical specifications, not translating a requirements document into user stories. All of those things that as a scrum master, you know, build an awesome backlog you can be there to help them, help guide them to build that backlog. So I wa wanted to also just throw out there that if you, are, if you have a new uh, product owner, uh, or new and absent, those are different, but if you've got a new product owner and you're just trying to build an initial backlog, we might do user story mapping. Oh, yeah. Or um, a, a way of get having the product owner who maybe used to be a product manager and is used to just giving a very high level big specification and uh, handing it off to someone else who's going to write up a spec. Uh, it might be a good technique to just try and get them into the groove of thinking about all of the steps they want to take and um, what those various stories might look like. Now I also want to address uh, the other half of that question which is with an absent product owner. Um, you know, visibility is a powerful thing. Part of the grand bargain of Scrum is that we're saying in our technology organization that, that we're going to give the power of uh, deciding what the team should be doing over to our business partners. But the, um, and then the business partners are accepting that the technology organization is going to get to uh, specify how long certain uh, development activities are going to take. So if you have an absent product owner who is potentially tragically not uh, giving you enough of a backlog to keep you busy, uh, let alone enough of a backlog that you can really go after the highest value work that's available for the team, I'd really recommend being transparent about that. You don't have to be accusatory or mean-spirited, but you cannot hide the fact that your team is not delivering as much value as it could because you're not getting sufficient input from your product organization. And just shine a light on it. And most of the time I've seen that people step up when they see the impact. The other thing, of course, is that if you have an insufficient backlog, it's a great time to start working on technical debt, improving, you know, do the care and feeding of your platform, set up your tooling, good time to work on automation, test automation, or CI, CD. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So another question that we have is, would you incorporate your MVPs in your backlog? What percentage? It's an interesting kind of meaty question. Um, your backlog should definitely reflect the MVPs. And I'm, I'm gonna, let me actually break MVP down a little bit. If we're talking uh, MVP in like the Eric Ree sense of the lean startup sense, uh, in that we're building the smallest thing that we can possibly build in order to learn something, absolutely. Your backlog should be made up of those experiments. And once you, have determined what to build, that, that experiment has been proven and you know which direction you should be going, then your backlog is full of validated backlog items that you can, with much more confidence, say these are the things that we can do to be successful with this product. You wanna add anything to that? Well, uh, I'm curious about the person who asked the question. Um, when they say incorporate your MVP in your backlog, do you mean as a separate item? or just as a collection of the things that are in your backlog. That's the way I've always thought of it. Yeah, I think I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to answer for them, hopefully. Um, I would say there are probably, probably maybe a mix of both. Uh, if they're thinking of MVPs as the 
the highest value things that they need to get, then it's going to be multiple items. Right. But if they're maybe t small increments that could get done in an entire sprint, okay. if it's, you know, one or two small experiments and those are small minimum learning um, pieces, then they could end up just being one, p one story for we want to learn this thing and okay. build that. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to go uh, touch on another one, which I thought was uh, kind of interesting here. The, um, uh, the question is, what should a PO do when a sprint fails? Now, I bring that up in a backlog refinement meeting only because um, there's two reasons that a, a sprint usually, well, maybe several, but a, a couple common reasons a sprint fails is that um, there's some, there was something inadequate in the backlog going into it, or that there was technical implementation questions that came up along the way. And it's really worth digging into that in your uh, retrospective to understand if there was something about the way the stories were understood or formed um, that might indicate a procedural improvement that you wanna do in the next sprint to make sure that that doesn't happen again. But in the, uh, in the case of a, a failed sprint, product owners be brave and just be transparent about it. You probably will get questions and you should be, have some answers about it, but uh, that's, uh, that's just another piece of information that we need to act on. Absolutely. We're running low on questions, so please, if you guys feel like you are wanting to ask a question, no question too small or too strange. So please ask those now. Okay. Um, Reese, did you want to talk about tech debt? We have another one here about is the PO aware of tech debt? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so technical debt is, if you are not familiar with that term, just kind of think of it as the corners we cut on the way to launching something. Um, those corners, if we're going to have a good maintainable product in the market, then mm -hmm. we should shore those corners up. We might have needed to get somewhere fast to learn something, but we don't want to keep that out there forever. If you start incurring too much technical debt, your velocity will eventually get to zero as the team swims in that kind of spaghetti or pool right. of bubblegum and tuck tape, which is the best way I've ever heard uh, technical debt raging out of control said. The product owner should absolutely be aware of that. That's the team's responsibility to bring that up. In that kind of time between backlog refinement and back, uh, sprint planning, the team should go look in the code and see what's in there. If there are some technical debt, uh, if there's some technical debt that they need to shore up, then they should bring that up and say, hey, this thing needs to get fixed as part of, of part of this. And that may end up being a separate backlog item or it may just be a task inside of the story that is in there. Okay. Um, we also have another question here about definition of ready. And Ooh. I'm actually, uh, a little chagrined that we didn't address definition of ready. Yeah. And when we are looking at our stories in backlog refinement, we're really trying to get the stories to a ready state that the team could pull it in. And that won't all, the, the one exception I can think of is if we understand the intent of a story and we understand how uh, the size of doing it, but maybe it's missing a particular item. A really common one is uh, a text or image that needs to be approved by someone. Think of a uh, text uh, that's going to show up in a public place that legal or compliance needs to look at and approve. That it's okay to say, well, this is story is going to be a five and it's uh, we understand the intent, but please note it somewhere prominently in the story, you know, it's not ready. It, it needs to have that final, that final component before we could pull it into a sprint. But definition of ready, it should be prominently displayed in your room when you're, uh, when you're going through refinement. So you take those lessons that you've learned from prior problems and incorporate it into your definition of ready that you, you can make sure you're hitting all those before you uh, move on to the next story. And absolutely, actually I've had, 
teams that have used two definitions already. Really? I know, this is crazy. One was their kind of gate into sprint planning, but they also had a definition already for coming into grooming, and it was for two reasons. One, okay. to make sure that the stories were really ready and, re and ready for them to talk about, and they weren't just out there. Notions. Notions. But it was also kind of a barrier to the, the team making sure that they weren't hyper-groomed, that every single little detail was fleshed out as we had a product owner who wanted to make sure every single tiny little thought was addressed. And so the it didn't leave a lot of room for the team mm -hmm. to chew into it and the team to be innovative and, and bring their brains. So they wanted to make sure that there was a kind of a barrier for, look, look we don't need all of this stuff. So it was mm -hmm. almost like a, like a gate there on definition of ready for backlog refinement. If all right. it works for them, that, that, can, that can totally work. Yeah. All right. right, so we got a bunch more questions that just came in. You guys took my things to heart. I love it. All right, ooh, Tiffany. <laughs> what if you are acting as both the scrum master and the product owner? I know it's taboo, but sometimes it's a reality. How would that work in a backlog refinement? Wow, if you've got one person who's both deciding what should be done and also governing the process of uh, how it gets uh, sized up, it sounds like, Tiffany, you've become a dictator and uh, it's a real challenge because yes. during that refinement meeting, you're supposed to be facilitating this meaty discussion around what the story is all about, but you're also supposed to be, as a scrum master, enforcing the process that makes sure that the team is uh, being honest and open about how uh, big the effort is. Mm -hmm. And it will be very hard to keep both of those hats on simultaneously and not find yourself swayed to uh, uh, pushing the team into making typically smaller uh, size estimates in order to facilitate moving down your backlog. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I, I'm actually working working with a team right now who's kind of going through something similar that they don't have a scrum master. They've, there's one about to start, so this isn't a, a, a permanent problem, but they wanted to make sure that they weren't putting all of that on the product owner. So we went through an exercise and identified some of the top things that they felt would hurt their team that the scrum master does if those things weren't done. And it was things like, escalation, uh, removing impediments, making sure everyone in the room has a voice, which is something that's very important during backlog refinement. Mm -hmm. And so they actually created a board and everybody signed up on the team to play or to make sure that they were playing that role. So in, in the case of you kind of having to make your brain do scrum master and product ownery things, it might be helpful to have the team kind of jump in and take on some of those scrum master uh, responsibilities to, to ensure that everybody has a voice and that nobody's kind of pressuring the team to move faster or, or yeah. you know. That's the temptation mm -hmm. and it's very hard to resist. We're, um, we, we have several more questions, but I just wanted to put out there that there's a real theme emerging today around how to deal with co-located teams. So I'm just gonna invite folks if they have some best practices or things that have really worked well for them with, uh, I'm sorry, not co-located, remote teams mm -hmm. or distributed teams. If you could throw that into the question box, um, I'd love to share them out or with people. It, let's do it into the chat and that way we can oh, share okay. it out with that and everybody and actually they can, should be able to see all of those too okay. and we'll call them out. Okay. So let's make sure that you're throwing them in there so that you can help out everybody here. Okay. We're not necessarily the smartest people in the room. You yeah. guys all are bringing your experiences yeah. to the table. So I want to address uh, Rusty's question. How much should we fear a failed sprint? How do you define a failed sprint? And uh, should a failed sprint be celebrated as a learning opportunity? Boy, that's a, that's a good one. The, the uh, fear, of course, is that if your organization doesn't allow people to stretch and fail, that you're just going to sandbag. Um, you know, if, if you're going to be, um, suffer, if you're going to suffer consequences of not completing 
your forecast, because remember, it's no longer a commitment, it's a forecast, then you're going to, um, any smart, quantitatively sophisticated person is going to make sure that they put enough of a buffer in there that it doesn't go bad. Um, I absolutely agree that uh, a failed sprint can be a learning opportunity. I wouldn't even call it a failed sprint, though. To be honest, that seems a little extreme. Um, I've, I, I don't even like the lingo, you know, if, uh, especially because it implies if you are 10% off that it's a failure. You know, it's not. It's, it's us doing our best rolling average of velocity over several months and doing our best to estimate quickly um, that feeds into our forecast. I, I really hope, Rusty, that you're not experiencing that kind of uh, uh, punishment around a failed sprint that you would feel uh, the need to avoid it. And I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even call it a failed sprint. Just it's yeah. a learning opportunity, like you said. And definitely you should, you should dig into those things in retro. Like what happened that we, either this thing grew really big or we brought things into the sprint that maybe weren't quite ready. And maybe that's an opportunity for us to create a definition of ready. Or maybe we didn't, as a team, take any time. The thing I hear most commonly, and that's why it was brought up as an item in the deck, was that we weren't prepped, that we dug into the code for the very first time in the middle of the sprint. And we discovered something. And we discovered something really big. And we know, like, we know that you're going to discover things. We can't figure everything out. We're dealing with complex problems and complex code bases. So we know that you're going to discover things during the sprint. We just don't want it to be like a catastrophic discovery. We want small discoveries along the way. But you'll have those catastrophic discoveries. <laughs> and when you do, I, I really hope uh, that your organization can change the way it looks at it and just say, we learned something. And one of the things I really coach uh, managers and executives on is when you go to a sprint review, don't look at it as a demo of delivered um, delivered items on a commitment. Look at it as a learning opportunity. I, I always coach managers to go into the uh, sprint review and just ask, what did you learn? And uh, changing that that way of looking at it is really crucial. So we have another question. What are ways to win hearts and minds when the team is actively contradicting the best practices of backlog refinement, insisting on digging into the how, writing tasks instead of stories, et cetera? Mostly we see that happen when there's maybe a misunderstanding of what the intent of backlog refinement is. If we're really digging in and saying, hey, the intent of backlog refinement is to dig into, you know, the what, the why, and figure out how big it is, we're not digging into the how, we're not really trying to get in there and show them the value. Show them that it model the behavior of, look, it is possible. That activity that we were just talking about where um, we, we go through and talk to the team about like, have you ever cooked dinner for yourself? Okay, have you cooked? You can show them that they can size things without digging super deep in there and then maybe do an activity with the team where they're sizing a lot of items at once and they're not digging into those and model that behavior and show them how it can be done and they can start seeing value. I've seen plenty of teams, I've seen even the, the most curmudgeonly folks on the team that were hard pressed to do that, see value when you do an activity like that. Okay. Um, so thank you, Isaac, that was a great question. Um, so Vidya uh, asked a question about um, digging in a little bit more into two types of definition of ready. Is it just, is it prepping for grooming and, mm -hmm. and then we're, re it's ready to take into backlog refinement and it's ready to be taken into the sprint? Correct. Yeah, it's, it, it's just two sets. It's ready for backlog refinement, ready for going into the sprint. Things in the sprint, maybe it's any, you know, questions resolved, we've sized it, we have as much acceptance criteria as we know. We, of course, might discover something during the sprint, but we should, um, those things would be in your definition of ready, but maybe in your, def or, sorry, definition of ready for sprint planning, but maybe in your definition for, of ready for backlog refinement, you have things like 
has some acceptance criteria, uh, mm -hmm. you know, is in the highest priority, but maybe doesn't have complete mocks. Maybe you, you mm -hmm. draw the line of, we wanna as a team be collaborating on those things. So please don't come in with a detailed spec. We, we don't want that to come into backlog refinement. We wanna talk about it. We want to really dig into it and come up with a solution as a team. Give us a problem and we'll solve it rather than just handing us a, here's a detailed solution you team are just executors, go make go. Right. I think it's another way of just encouraging folks to be prepared that if we're going to go into a, a refinement meeting where we're, it's a very expensive meeting, right? You're going to have the entire team yeah. and supporting cast there for an hour. Um, it just really behooves the product owner to have really thought it through in advance and also then for the team to be uh, prepared as well. Absolutely. So we have about four minutes left and we've got four questions. It looks like, ooh, no, actually, let's, yeah, let's jump into these couple of distributed teams. So uh, S-Fires uh, jumped in there and uh, talked about some things that were working for their distributed teams. I think most of them are around just being human, you know, mm -hmm. just you know, creating personal relationships. So we have here, learn to say hello and thank you in the local language. That's oh. awesome. Um, yeah, I totally have sympathy for the, the the team members who are dialing in from another country. You know, I've certainly had folks in Mexico and India and uh, Russia, and it, it's totally worth your time just to learn Hi. How, how to say hello and thank <laughs> you in, in their native tongue. Um, they're doing the whole meeting in your tongue. You might as well uh, learn just how to say hello. Yeah, absolutely. Using video cams, uh, static photos while meeting to kind of feel like you're in the same time. Yeah, we, we've had times oh. when we had only yeah, yeah. one just uh, one remote team member where we actually made a, made a picture, uh, you know, printed up a picture of them and placed it on top of the speakerphone just so we could talk to oh, them. Oh, that's such a great idea. Um, yeah, make it. Um, Make it as personal as you can, because so much of this is just of what we're preaching here today yeah. is about making, uh, having the whole human being come into work. And so you've got to greet yeah. that whole human being. Absolutely. And some of the rest of the things that he added in or she added in there were about just really being human. And this has nothing to do with being remote or not. But learning things about each other as a team, you can collaborate so much better when you think of each other as humans not as humans who have outside lives and outside desires and mm -hmm. kids and hobbies and things like that. If you know those things about the rest of the team, you're going to work together in a much more collaborative environment. You're going to hold each other accountable. You're going to be real and open with each other in a much different way. So learning things about movie genres and things that people love, that's going to be great for remote or non-remote. We actually have one more one more. And then we're going to uh, close it off. Then we'll close it off. One more question in our uh, window here. Um, Jade asks, should stories be assigned in refinement? And this is such an easy one, Jade. No. Nope. They shouldn't be assigned in refinement. They shouldn't be assigned in sprint planning. Remember that we're doing here is having a team understanding. Um, and it's a team, not commitment, forecast of what the team can do. If nothing changes. If, and <laughs> we, we want to make sure that uh, we don't assign it to a single individual because there's just no way that the folks who aren't assigned uh, can stay actively engaged if they know that it's Reese's story. I don't really care. Yeah. About it. It's her story. I got all my stuff done. Yeah. How much of a team is that? All right. Thank you guys so, so much Thank for you. spending your lunch hour with us today. We will see you guys next month.